specialist at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, or ACES. Um, if this is your first time here at Holland Lake, welcome. If you've been here a million times, welcome back. Um, every winter, ACES partners with Wilderness Workshop and the Roaring Fork Audubon to co-host these Naturalist Nights, um, this free winter seri speaker series featuring experts from across the country who explore different topics of the natural world with our community. Talks are hosted every other week, Wednesdays at the Roaring Fork High School in Carbondale, and Thursdays here at Howell Lake. We would like to take a minute to thank our generous sponsors that help make Naturalist Nights a success. Thank you to our Gold Level sponsors, Reese Henry, Ken Ransford, um, and Clark's Market. And our Silver Level sponsors, Aspen Square, Ute Mountaineer, Blazing Adventures, um, Bristlecone Mountain Sports, and also thanks to um, Two Leaves and a Bud, Aspen Snowmass, and Bonfire, Bonfire Coffee. These businesses provide financial and in-kind donations that make Naturalist Nights possible, including cooks and tea that you're enjoying right now. Grassroots TV is live streaming tonight's presentation on their website, um, Wilderness Workshop, and ACES Facebook page and YouTube channel, so you can find it many different places. <coughs> a cleaned up recording will be made available on ACES and Wilderness Workshops YouTube channel in the coming days. And we hope you'll join us here next Wednesday for our Potbelly Perspectives talk, Loving Aspen, stories from Sandy and Mary Lynn Monroe, and in two weeks for our next Naturalist Night, The Language of Birds with Nathan Pikesdale. And now, I'm so excited to introduce tonight's presentation on Identiflight Technology. Identiflight International was created to facilitate the coexistence of avian wildlife and wind energy. It provides a super smart and sophisticated tool um, to detect and protect bird species from collisions with wind turbines. Our speakers, Carlos Horquera and Susan Downey, are coming to us tonight to teach us a little more about how Identiflight works and why this technology is so important to the development of wind energy. Carlos was born in Chile, studied physics and electrical engineering at MIT, and then began, began his career at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, where he worked on imaging systems for all kinds of really cool astronomy projects. He founded Boulder Imaging 27 years ago with the goal of combining AI and human, oh, AI and high performance imaging technologies to be able to mimic human perception to solve problems. Applications of this technology include inspecting large quantities of things super fast, such as um, money and currency printing, and most recently, the Identiflight system for protecting sensitive bird species and wind farms. Susan is from Colorado, from Boulder, Colorado, and studied physics at the University of Colorado. Go Buffs. Thank and you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and began her career at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as well, working on all kinds of cool projects like NASA's Galileo mission to Jupiter. She is a founding member and has contributed to Boulder Imaging in many roles throughout the last 27 years, but none have combined her love for nature, birds, and technology, as well as her current role in teaching Identiflight how to become an expert birder. So we might need to try and get Susan and Carlos to join the naturalist team after the talk. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Please remember to hold your questions until the end of the presentation when we'll do a quick little Q&A session. Um, thanks so much, and please welcome Carlos and Susan. Good evening. Uh, turn on your thingamabob. Oh, I think it should be on. Term thingamabob. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is uh, we're so excited to be able to share. Um, what we do uh, at Identify, what this technology is doing throughout the world today. Uh, and, and we, of course, love talking about birds. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're very, very happy to be here. Um, so, so Identify, um, and I, I'll, I'll go into uh, a lot of detail here in terms of the technology. But at a higher level, uh, our, our mission is to try to minimize wildlife impacts in, in renewable energy. Specifically, um, our current uh, focus is on, on wind energy. So I'll show you here briefly um, uh, uh, in a video that's coming up uh, exactly how that works. But I'll start with a little introduction in terms of our history so you get a, an idea where, well, uh, um, what we've been doing for the last 11 years or so in, in, in this field. Um, uh, well, Boulder Imaging, our, the, the parent company, has been around for almost 30, 30 years. Susan and I founded it after 
uh, working at JPL, and we did, had this notion of bringing um, uh, advanced imaging techniques into uh, world applications, that, uh, you know, everyday type of applications that could have great value from that, you know, high tech. And um, Identify came about about 11 years ago, ago from discussions with um, local wind developers that we kept running into challenges with developing wind farms and the, the potential impacts to wildlife at, at those wind farms. Um, and we started developing the technology from just a, literally a napkin uh, a concept in 2012. Uh, within four years, we had our first prototypes and first installations in Wyoming. And from, from that, the success of those installations with independent verification studies, we were able to start deploying uh, full, full coverage at wind farms in 2018. Um, and then from there, we continue to progress the technology in many ways. So let me talk about what it is that Identify does. Let me click the video here. So Identify is essentially a, it's a, it's a device it, that mounted on top of a tower, and I'll show you pictures of that a little later, that is looking all around for, um, for birds that are moving through a space out to a kilometer in distance all around it. And when it detects that something that's moving, that could potentially be a bird, it, it will actually lock into it and track it. And the squiggly lines you're seeing through there, actually the, the, the physical tracks that is, is following of each of those birds. And when it detects that, uh, that, that species, is, is sends that a species that needs protection, um, it will actually curtail the turbine. As you see that turbine there shut down and it's allowing the eagle to fly through unharmed. So, th so that's, that's the basic concept, and, uh, and I'll show you how we do go about doing that. Because you, you can probably imagine, I mean, um, it's a kilometer away, and even an eagle is just a little dot, right? It's in, uh, and we need to be able to, to detect these eagles, these birds, um, in all conditions, from dawn to dusk, uh, whether it's raining, whether it's snowing, any, any conditions conceivable, whether the, the sun is in the wrong place, um, giving you a, a backlit image. The, the system needs to be able to deal with all those, all those conditions in a completely uncontrolled environment out there. So I'm just replaying the video here just to sh show you some of the... Um, um, so, so all these squiggly lines are, are flybys of various birds. It, these particular ones are all eagles. And so this, that's an example of an, if a track going right through the road swept zone where it could tail the turbine and allow the eagle to fly through safely. All right, so, um, so let me dive into the technology it's, it, uh, itself. Uh, so the, the system, well, let me back up a little bit here, one sec. So you can see over here, um, this is the identify uh, sensor head on the top of a tower. This is about six meters tall, and, and the height can vary quite a bit, depending on the topography, the terrain, and so on. And, and this sit, it sits on its own, some distance away from, from a turbine, and we get power from the turbine itself. Um, and, uh, and it covers all, every, all around a kilometer in, in all directions uh, looking for birds. So, it, it, so ultimately, um, as many turbines that can fit within that one kilometer radius are the, the, the turbines that are being uh, watched over by the identified units. And for, so for a large um, wind farm, we will have, we can have, you know, 30, 40 systems out there throughout the wind farm that are mo monitoring all movements through the wind farm. So the technology itself is composed of two main elements, uh, these what we call wide field of view cameras um, that are, are the ones that are, are looking out to a kilometer and, and if you can picture a dome of coverage um, going out a kilometer in all directions, vertically up and in all directions. And, and they are essentially detecting motion. Um, and when they, they see a pattern of motion that can potentially be an, a bird, uh, the sensor head up, uh, on top, oops, the sensor head on, on top here uh, will actually move and lock into that bird and track it. Uh, and it does this with two pairs of eyes, so the stereo vision. And the reason that we do that is because we are able to measure distance to the bird. Um, and 
measuring distance, we, we can actually measure dimensions. We can measure velocity vectors, trajectories, the potential uh, a collision course. So we can really dial in precisely where the birds can potentially end up and then curtail that, that turbine if it happens to be in its way. Um, so this spins around in every direction, measure distance. Uh, we, from now we infer the wingspan. Uh, we collect all kinds of other uh, metrics as well that can be used for um, uh, behavioral studies. Uh, but so let me uh, let me go into um, well where we deployed so far. So so um, eight years ago we started in Wyoming. Uh, um, the, the systems uh, were studied in, by uh, Peregrine Fund. In fact, uh, did a study to measure to determine the efficacy of this wind farm, and the results were highly positive, and because of that, um, we were able to now um, gain ac uh, um, acceptance in, 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 in install installations throughout the world. Um, 41 wind farms in nine different countries, five continents so far, uh, and protecting for over 650 turbines so far. Um, it's always increasing. Uh, and we're deployed in a, a myriad of, of different environments. Uh, here is an installation in Tasmania. Uh, this is in Utah. Um, you see, you know, obviously, as we can handle winter conditions, everything. Well, the, the, power, the power needs, as I was mentioning before, we, we actually do need some power because, well, we have a, a processor, but the biggest um, need for power is the winter time to make sure that our, our viewports don't, don't freeze up. So we have to be able to always be able to see birds. So we have to have heaters that uh, prevent uh, from any icing event. Uh, this is an, our newest installation going on right as we speak in Uzbekistan. Uh, it's a very large installation, it's a 500 megawatt, so it's about 110 turbines that for which we're uh, protecting. And this gives you an idea of kind of the, the installation. We, we get power from the transformer at the, at the base of the turbine. There's some trenching that goes on that provides power. And most, very importantly, of course, the, the network connectivity that allows us to uh, control all the turbines to be able to curtail them and, you know, in time and, and so on. Um, yeah, uh, here's a really busy slide. But, uh, most, mostly what we want to show you with this is uh, our path in technology development and how that continues to evolve in our plans for the future. So we are we're here today, 2024, we're, we're up to our version five uh, evolution of the technology. And along the way here, you can see the list of species that we're protecting continues to increase. Uh, today we're actually, this doesn't even cover the full list, it's 31 species, and Susan will go into a lot more detail about those species soon. Uh, shortly here, um, and then V6 is, is expanding to offshore applications and nighttime applications where we're, we're looking for migratory passerine bats, bat movement, uh, movement through, through uh, near shore installations, um, and, and any species that could be, you know, and could be in, in danger doing night, nighttime activities. Um, and, and so the, the progression, uh, you, you, so if, if you, the video, I was hoping that the video can give you a, a, a sense of the scale and the, and the challenges with it, developing a technology such as this. Um, uh, in, in the, um, and how important it is for the technology to be able to, um, to deal with almost un an unlimited number of variables in an uncontrolled environment, right? So to do that, uh, um, we, we incorporate uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning into almost every aspect of the technology. Um, and, and I was talking about motion sensing. It needs to, the system needs to be able to learn its environment because there's always things moving out there. There's a branch shaking over here, there's a turbine in the distance. The system is always learning that. It's adapting for what the environment is how that, that, that the environment is changing around it so that it can then focus on the birds and pick out the birds and not be distracted by other things. Um, and of course, with the, with the species identification, which Susan will show you in more detail, uh, that's long list here, um, the ability to distinguish different 
similar looking birds from each other. You know, you all are probably birders, so you know how tricky ca that can be, right? Um, so, uh, um, it, and Susan will show you several examples where we're definitely being challenged. In, but uh, it's an, a phenomenal uh, use of machine learning, artificial intelligence. It, it's, it's a great application of it. It's right here, and, and it's, and it's sort of, um, um, uh, it's, it's showing tremendous results. Uh, so going back to our history here, so we started down here, and initially we were able to provide protection levels um, for, for uh, golden eagles and bald eagles in North America, uh, a protection rate of about 95% um, when we first started. And we are here now, and we're exceeding 99%. Um, so we the protection accuracy is, is up to 99% of these, and, and continue to increase. And that's, that's with, this, uh, with the long list of species that we're protecting for. Um, so that's, that's, the, um, um, that's in respect to, the, to, to the, our, our false negative error rates that I'm talking about. So that's uh, the ability to protect and, and, and correctly identify the sensitive species that we're trying to protect. On the flip side of that, uh, we have another error rate called the false positive rate, which is confusing a non-protected species with one that's protected. And, and the impact that has is that um, you are end up curtailing more often than you would normally for birds that are not sensitive, either because they're locally sensitive or endangered species, right? Um, and, and that's, of course, important to to a, a wind farm that, that its goal is to generate energy as much as possible, as, uh, efficient, efficiently, right? Uh, so that's an important consideration. And uh, when we started, we were around 30% uh, false positive rates. Now, uh, over here, we're less than 3%. So tremendous uh, progress being made as, uh, along the way of also in, in, uh, expanding our ability to to deploy in many different regions. We started with just Prairie Mountain region in Wyoming. Now uh, we went to Tasmania with mountainous and um, forested terrain with tall canopies um, and have evolved into all kinds of topographies and uh, geographies that you, you, know, you can think of at this point. All right. Um, I also mentioned the, uh, the early on the importance of verification. So this, this green down here just highlights um, our, oh, you know, it's always been our, our company culture to be very open with our, our, our data and uh, uh, involve independent parties throughout the US and uh, Europe to review that data and uh, assess the efficacy of the technology, and uh, that's something we're very proud about. Because ultimately, you know, we're, we're we're trying to make a difference, and we want to do the right thing, and and so that's also it's, it's been a very high priority for us. All along. So I was going to switch over now to some live displays. Sorry. Okay, so um, let me go back here. So I'm, gonna, I'm replaying a, from a wind farm. This is a, a live operating wind farm. I'm just replaying data back from a few a few days ago, from actually January 11th. Uh, this is in California, where they have a resting population of golden eagles that hang out there, as you can see on the right. Um, and and so what what this is showing is these, um, well, I can see a pointer here. Uh, these are turbines. The orange circles are identified units. The circles are the, the one kilometer hemisphere I was talking about of detection. And, and what you see here is that there's a lot of overlap between these circles. The reason that's necessary here is because uh, there's very pronounced topography, uh, hills that can occlude line of sight. And so we have to Put, put a higher density of units to be able to see around behind the hills and so on. Because um, uh, we don't want to miss an incoming eagle and, and we want to be able to have enough time to detect it and allow the turbine to slow down. Uh, oh, that's an important thing I should mention. Um, 
and I'll, well, I'll get to that shortly here, in some of, some of our data that, um, with, uh, with respect to curtailment of, of turbines. Um, so what you see here is uh, these red, when they turn red, it means we curtail the turbines. Uh, we detected these are eagles here. Uh, we detected the eagles and we curtail the turbines because of either they're getting too close or, or there's a potential collision course with, with those turbines. Um, you'll also see that all these other little uh, green dots here for other species of birds for which we're, we're not currently uh, uh, you know, curtailing turbines. At this particular site, there's a high a density of, of galls because of the landfill over here. And so we, hit, we get thousands of galls going through the here every single day. And this is where the false positive is so important, right? If we're, um, Imagine a wind, uh, you know, a, a wind, tur wind farm wouldn't be want to shut down turbines all day long for, for gulls that, that are very abundant. I mean, obviously, there's certain gull species that are protected in certain regions, but these particular gulls are very abundant. Um, all right, so let me show you some other screens. So, so you can imagine that uh, we're capturing tracks um, uh, and data from these birds uh, daily on the order of thousands of tracks. And each track is, uh, what we mean by a track is a flyby. So we, we detect the bird, then we lock into it, we follow it, we determine the curtailment signal, and, and then it moves on, right? Um, and each of those tracks may last everything anywhere from 10 seconds to minutes. Um, and we're, we are capturing, well, the, the system is processing 10, image, 10 images per second and making all the decision making is doing. Um, so it can be, it's able to react and, and make a, a decision to curtail within two seconds on average. Um, so it's very, very fast. Um, and if, out of that data, we store these images here uh, about one per, per, uh, one per second into the, our database and that contains all the, the 3D positions in space, all, all, all the flight patterns, all, all these birds are being stored into a large database. Um, and over time, you can start to, uh, you have the ability to look at that data in many different ways to get an idea of um, how these birds are using the terrain. So this is a wind farm in Tasmania. So um, let's see if I show, there we go. There's Tasmania, it's smack in the middle. Um, Okay, let's zoom in. So what I'm showing you here is, what I'm trying to show you here, is uh, an activity heat map. So this is over a period of uh, 30 days, the last 30 days of, uh, uh, and, and it's selected only for the protected species, which in Tasmania, at this particular site, we're protecting for the wedge-tailed eagle, the most amazing eagle you can, you can think of. It's my favorite eagle. <laughs> Very particular. Uh, and also the white belly sea eagle. Um, and, uh, and so what's really fascinating about this is that, so let me zoom in a little bit more. You can start to see the tur individual turbines here, turbine, turbine, turbine. Um, what's fascinating about this is that it's, um, when a wind developer is uh, planning to develop a particular wind, uh, wind farm, they you know, normally do an environmental impact study. They, um, they're looking for what is the bird activity at the site, they do surveys, um, and, and you know, some, some, well, lately they've been starting to use uh, Identify, but without Identify is, is um, folks with binoculars and sitting there and doing some sampling of, of activity. So you, you get, you know, that, so they get some idea of activity, but when you put Identify at the site, you get, you get thousands of tracks every single day, and you can really get a tremendous amount of information about what the activity, uh, what the preferential use of the terrain is for these eagles. Uh, and this is what's quite unexpected, that you would get this tremendous level of activity right next to the, the, the shoreline of this lake. Um, there's also, here's a, there's a, a 40 meter canopy high uh, forest from which uh, these turbines are, are here, these little dots here are turbines. Um, 
they come out out of the, the forest, and they're above the canopy by uh, about 30 meters over the canopy. Um, but if they knew, if they had known about this, they were, would never have put them there. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's good to know that most developers, they want to do the right thing, too. They don't want to get into trouble. They don't want to get, they don't want to put this turbine somewhere that they're going to end up with all these incidents, right? Collisions, uh, they don't, you know, it, 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 what's great is that, that most, more recently in the last year or two, um, we have more and more developers that are coming to Identiflight early on in the process to, to be, be more informed and um, so that when they actually plan the location of the turbines, they take uh, all these factors into consideration, which in this particular case, protecting for birds over a forest canopy is very difficult because the bird can, uh, well, wedge, luckily wedge-tail eagles are not flying through the forest. They don't typically do that. But other birds, like red kites, for example, in, in Europe, they'll do that. They'll go into the forest and they'll come out and pop out. So uh, that's difficult to protect because when, once they pop out, you have only a short time of, uh, to be able to curtail that turbine and allow enough time to slow down, right? So that's, those are very important considerations that um, we have learned through all this data capturing that's going on, at all these wind sites, um, and it's just fascinating data. Um, on this side, on the eastern side, uh, there's some steep drop-offs. Uh, everyone expected that to be the, the highest use for the eagles, and they do use it. They love it because they get autographic uplift. Um, so it's a uh, it's uh, the kind of terrain that just, it, the terrain itself facilitates uplift for the eagles. And, and most of the birds that we deal with, raptors and, and large uh, vultures, they really don't like to uh, flap their wings. So they, they truly prefer that terrain over most any other terrain. Because uh, they, can, they can, they go hang out there in the morning, then the wind, the wind picks up, and then they just go and uplift, and they can do the circles and start doing their sweeps. Um, but, but this was quite surprising. Um, now, I think it's, it's some number of those are the, the white-bellied seagulls, right? That you get white-bellied seagulls, they, they, they cannot do this. Uh, they sweep. They go up and down the coastline. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and, um, and they get into, into uh, territorial fights with the, the wedgies as well. Let's see. So those are uh, heat maps uh, that show us uh, um, uh, give us great insight, insight about uh, what the birds are doing at the wind farm, how they use the rain, and uh, let me show you another screen here. One second. Um, tons of data that uh, uh, when you look at data, this, this what this is showing is uh, day by day. Uh, counts of detected tracks. The orange are for the protected species. He, this particular site in Wyoming is uh, their eagles. The gray are other species, and you can see how there's uh, um, you know migratory patterns here. Um, in winter time, you get a, a dramatic decrease of other species, and it's just what you're left over is a local population of eagles that resides there. It's typically it's actually only like five that stay through the winter. Uh, and then you get some mi migratory eagles come in later, as well as you get hawks and all kinds of other birds that move through the terrain. Um, but we, you know, of course, we, we, we find this all extremely interesting, uh, fascinating data to be capturing. Um, and let me show you, okay, so, uh, so uh, curtailment. Of course, uh, the, the key mission for Identiflight is to be able to to shut down a turbine uh, fast enough so that the bird can pass safely, right? So for every single curtailment, what I'm going to show you here is uh, this is a plot over time for, one, for each turbine. This is the RPM, the revolutions per minute. So it starts at 10, um, 8 in the morning, and we detected, detected bird. We curtail. You see the shutdown, the restart. The bird, another bird showed up, we could tell again, restart, and so on. So we record every single event. 
we, we measure every single event, and whenever we detect some, something anomalous, like it took too long to slow down or anything of that nature, we generate alarms. And this just happens every single day, every single hour of the day. And so that we provide that feedback to, to our, the, site, our, the operators on site um, to deal with any potential issue that might be going on with a particular turbine. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, this is, of course, our mission is right here. This is what we, our job number one is to be able to shut down those turbines and be effective at protecting for these bird species. All right, so uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Susan now. She's gonna talk, talk a lot all about birds. And uh, to just give you some context here, uh, keep in mind, one kilom kilometer away at distance in any condition, um, this is, this is the kind of images that you're going to see, whether the systems capture, right? It could be a cloudy day, it could be a backlit day, the birds against the sun. And so Susan will show you some examples of these sort of things and how our system is able to deal with them and still provide um, a high level of identification and accuracy. Oh, oh yeah, yes. Excellent. All right, so that was the technology, that was the funny part. We're going to geek out over birds. Um, that is a question at a lot of trade shows and a lot of things we get, and, and it, it, it comes down to the um, targeted curtailment, that these are all images from our systems of different birds around the world, and from this, we can tell the difference between um, a honey buzzard and a common buzzard. Oh, that's an important thing. Buzzards in England or in Europe are hawks. So when I say buzzard, I actually am saying hawk, but they call them buzzards. So honey buzzard and common buzzard are hawks. Um, they're, yeah, anyway. Um, so uh, 31 species right now um, are what we, our, our systems are trained for and, um, and we protect for. We know our system knows more species than this because we need to know like a common buzzard or a red tail hawk um, to unfortunately not curtail for them. But uh, this is our protected species list and, and it is growing every time we put in a new um, site. We're going into South Africa this summer and so we're going to have some more really cool birds. Oh my gosh. All right, so we started with uh, in the U.S. with eagles, bald eagles and golden eagles. And, and we thought that was hard, you know, because a bald eagle adult, very classic, but then the juvenile it can be very different. It has white, it could be all dark, it could look like a golden eagle. And then the golden eagle juvenile with the white um, wing patches are completely different than the adults. And um, over time we did, our system is able to tell that all of these birds on the left are all bald eagles, all those on the right are golden eagles. Um, whether they look similar or different, our system has learned that. And so we would go into it saying, oh yeah, that's a gold eagle, that's a bald, a bald eagle, and, and we thought we were pretty good. Um, another species, the, a third species in the US that is protected uh, is our condors, um, California condors. So cool. So these guys fly way up high, way overhead. Um, we, there, you know, they're 400 meters above the swept zone of the of the rotors. So they, as of what we've seen now, these guys have been really far away. But we can tell these are four different individuals here. Um, so we can, if needed, you know, we we could do some kind of behavior or survey or the different uh, wing patches. Um, and that is going to be really fun to, to really get to protect the, protect the condors because they are critically endangered. Um, some of our challenges. So the first photos were nice and pretty. This is more like what we get. We get butt shots and we get kind of, 
you know, cloudy, blurry shots because there's haze, there's clouds, there's snow. Um, so what we have here, the three on the top are all three different species, and the three on the bottom are different species. The first one is uh, golden eagle, then turkey vulture and raven. Um, and so part of what we needed to do is go and figure out how to tell those apart. So um, a golden eagle, the one on the left on the top, it's got a big round body, really long wings. The raven on the other side has a big round body, but the wings aren't quite as long compared to the size of the body. Um, and then a turkey vulture has more of a V-shaped body, partly because it's always looking down and its little pokey beak um, is looking down. And so you usually can see its little pokey beak. So there's, there's teeny little differences in this that we're getting really good at being able to tell the difference between birds that look very similar. So on the bottom, this is the golden eagle on the left looking down something so we can't see his head. Uh, and then normal turkey vulture behavior is you can't see its head because it's really small. So they're similar. They're, in the turkey vulture, the wings, the, the wrists are bent back a little bit. And that's an important um, field mark of turkey vultures. They can straighten their wrists, of course. But if we see the bent wrist, then more than likely it's a turkey vulture. And then the raven, when they really want to be big and gigantic, they can look very similar to a um, golden eagle. They're just smaller. So it's, that was some of the challenges we came across is how do you tell the difference between these birds when they decide to look alike? And, um, and we have trained our system to do that, which is really cool. So and this is where now we're being challenged. I thought I'd start with Uzbekistan because these are all our new birds that we're getting to learn. And they are so stinking cool. So step eagle, golden eagle, same as ours, imperial eagle. Um, the top are, they're all dark brown birds. Um, so if they don't have the sun on them perfectly and you can't see all the field marks, these are going to be really hard to tell apart. Um, golden eagle in the middle, long tail. Tail's about as long as the wing is wide. Um, so if we see it has a long tail and we can tell, it's a golden eagle, we're done, we're moving on. If it has a short tail, well then it could be either a step eagle or an imperial eagle, or a greater spotted eagle, which we haven't seen yet, um, but they will be there in the spring. And so then we have to go back and depend on other field marks. Um, coloration, the, the, the um, imperial eagle has the two white marks on its back in conjunction with other things that can be used as a determination. And if we can't see the tail, then it still could be a golden eagle. And so now we have all these four eagles that look alike. Um, and one thing is these are all protected in Uzbekistan. So that we put them together and we say, well, this is an eagle. We're not really sure what kind it is. We're going we're gonna to stop the turbines for it anyway. So um, right now, we, my team, we have a, I have a team of classifiers that our job is to go through and tell the truth that Identiflight gives us these images. And we don't know what identif Identiflight called them, we then identify them. And we're the truth tellers. And that's how we can tell how good Identiflight's doing. And then we create a huge data set of golden eagles and step eagles. And we feed that into the system. And then it learns all the specifications of the eagle. As babies or youngins, they're really easy to tell apart. Um, there's lots of good features. The, the golden eagle has the. Um, the wing panels and imperial eagles are really light underneath. Um, so when we see the young ones, that's a lot easier. As soon as they turn into adults, they all start to look alike, um, unless we get some really good, fun images. But we got really good, fun images. New in Uzbekistan for us, bearded vultures and Egyptian vultures. Egyptian vultures are critically endangered. Um, and they are super unique. So we should very easily be able to see them. We, we got a little bit of data in July and haven't seen them since. So hopefully they're coming back soon and we can get some more data with them. Bearded vultures, um, these guys are funky with their huge tails. And these guys are massive. They're about two and a half meters uh, wingspan. And in this first image, you can see his little beard. So cute. Um, and then uh, we also protect for white-tailed eagles in Uzbekistan as well. And we. In Europe, we first encountered white-tailed eagles, and so we had a huge data set. We learned them. And so as we moved into Uzbekistan, right off the bat, we can protect for 
white-tailed eagles because we already have that data. All these new birds, we're collecting data right now and um, feeding it back into the system and we're teaching it what all of these new birds are. Um, Saker falcons are locally sensitive to the area. That's why they're on the list of birds that we are going to curtail for. They're about the size of a peregrine falcon. In bad lighting, they could be confused for a peregrine. It's okay, we'll deal with that and we'll curtail for both. Um, but they're, they're a very unique um, bird. They're very light. They have cool dirtiness under their wings. Um, so when we can get good images, we can do it. And we actually have already trained for these. So our system that's running in Uzbekistan right now says, yep, that's a saker falcon. Need to, need to curtail for that. So that was one of our newest birds put into the system. Um, one of my favorites is the uh, short-toed snake eagle. Cool name. But also, look at all those stripies. That is the coolest bird. Um, it is just... It just pops out. It's a stripies. It's got fingers and a hood, and it is so cool. This is another one we just got a glimpse of in the summer, and then they disappeared. Uh, and so they will come back uh, here in the spring. We have a lot of work to do this spring when all these birds come back. Um, and then we should also see booted eagles. So we're gonna we're gonna learn about those. Um, in Uzbekistan, they have vultures, big gigantic vultures. So. Um, this was one that, uh, when we were talking about environmental studies, the one in the middle is a Himalayan griffin, a Eurasian griffin, Himalayan griffin, and Cinerus vulture. The developers did not know that Himalayan griffins were in the area. And so we found one, found more than one, um, and so instantly that went on the protected list. They're like, hmm, that's interesting, oops. So we are protecting for both. These Two first uh, griffins are so similar. One is a lighter brown, the other is a little darker brown. There's different variations of both. Um, so for the most part, we're probably going to just have a griffin, and it looks like a griffin, we're gonna curtail for it. So um, with enough data and enough practice, we'll be able to tell them apart, but to begin with, we're just gonna curtail for all of them. And then the guy at the end is the Cineris vulture. These guys are huge. They can be over three meters in um, wingspan. And they're the classic vultury. They have the scary head, and um, they're pretty fun. We, um, we, they are in France as well, and so we're collecting data in France uh, with the Cineris vultures and the Eurasian griffins. Also, oh no, now we're moving to Europe. Uh, Europe, so white-tailed eagles. And what's interesting is White-tailed eagles are kind of like our bald eagles, and um, imperial eagles are kind of like our golden eagles, that they similar coloration, similar behaviors. So the white-tailed eagle, as an adult, big white tail, super short, so those are pretty easy to tell apart. Um, imperial eagle, same imperial eagle that we see in Uzbekistan, so we have a lot of data of that that we can use in Uzbekistan. And then there's um, lesser spotted eagles, and one thing with them is they have the three spots. So they have two wing spots and one on their tail. And that's pretty indicative of, of a lesser spotted eagle and a greater spotted eagle, which we will see in um, Uzbekistan. But from what I've been told, we have very little chance of telling lesser spotted eagle apart from greater spotted eagle. Uh, why these eagles choose to be so similar just to confuse us. Um, cool kites, look at these. So these are red kites uh, and then black kites. Red kites have this amazing red forked tail, uh, three or four different colors underneath, gray heads. Um, they are just fun birds to look at. Uh, then the black kite is like a muted red kite. So it's not quite the forked tail, not quite the coloration underneath. Um, but they um, often fly in mixed flocks, and so we'll, we'll definitely see both of those. And then just recently, ospreys um, became protected in Germany, so we are using our osprey data um, to protect them as well. And then some of the fun birds we get to see um, and protect, the Eurasian spoonbill. So these are black and white with a little bit of yellow. They are really cool. Um, 
In the US, we have a roseate spoonbill in Florida. Um, but these guys are all white. And then uh, black storks, which look like they're wearing little tuxedos. Um, OK, so big tuxedos. These are actually very, very big birds. Um, so these guys are all also on the protected list. And we get to look for them and protect them as well. Um, not quite as friendly are the harriers, because they all look alike. So we have marsh harrier, hen harrier, Montague's harrier, and pallid harrier. In the US, we have northern harrier, uh, which is kind of like the hen harrier, which is the middle bird there, um, that the arbor, our harrier and the European harriers, um, those are similar. Um, so there are differences, more white, less white, some striping, so we can tell them apart. The females are a little harder. Um, marsh harrier and hen harrier have five fingers. Montagues and pallid have four fingers. So if we're lucky and we can see them and count the fingers, then we got it, we're on it. We can, we can put those in buckets. Um, buzzards. Uh, so Eurasian honey, uh, yeah, Eurasian honey buzzard. So cool, um, I guess, but from what I've learned, it's not a buzzard and it doesn't eat honey. Uh, so, but I think it eats bees and that's where it came from on the honey buzzard. But super stripey, really fun, big long head, um, long tail. And what I have down here is a common buzzard. And so that common buzzard has the carpal patches, same as the honey buzzard. Um, and our system can actually tell those apart. If some of some other systems, you might not get this, well, you don't get this kind of image. And you wouldn't know the difference between a honey buzzard and a common buzzard. Um, but that this is one of this is why I identify it right here, is because we can tell, we can go down into the different plumages and tell you what kind of bird you're looking at. Um, Kestrels are protected, and then um, peregrine falcons as well. And supposedly, well, no, not supposedly, the Eurasian bittern. Never seen one yet. They fly in the reeds. Um, so if we see one, we'll protect it, but we haven't seen one yet. And then finally in Tasmania, Carlos's eagle, um, the wedge-tailed eagle, similar to our golden eagle and the white belly sea eagle, similar to our bald eagle, uh, massive birds, huge tails. It's the Tasmanian subspecies that is protected. Um, these guys are pretty healthy on the mainland of Australia and they do really well, but it's the, the Tasmanian subspecies that they're trying to protect. And um, they just have massive tails, they're gigantic birds. And then there's the white belly sea eagle with its really cool black and white. Um, really cool. So there's your bird geeking for the day. <laughs> Love it. And that is, um, that is all we have. Yay. questions. I'm going to, when I come to you to ask your question, just talk into the mic. It's not going to project, but it's just um, for the recording. Okay, questions. White-fronted goose is one example. Right? Greater white-fronted goose, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, that. Uh, so, if you remember those, the white field view cameras, looking around, all around, they're always they're, they're keeping track of everything that they de detect. So they have actually have a count of how many birds are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the stereo system can lock, will lock it into one, maybe a couple of birds at a time, right? And it has to switch between them. Um, so, so we know that there's a bunch of birds. And then we, as soon as we identify one or two within that, that flock, that we know what species are most likely to compose that flock. And uh, there's a prescription that if it's more than a certain number, more, for example, in, in parts of Europe, is it more than three cormorants flying together, we could tell. Less, we don't. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's what it, you know, that's what it is. It's not our choice, but it's just yeah. what it is today, right? Um, 
in in ultimately um, okay so 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 yes so I just like can count the number of birds um, and identify enough members within a flock to be able to then make decisions on 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 that, whether that's a a particular species that needs protection and then small birds uh, well the small birds uh, that's coming up because uh, you can imagine uh, the further away a bird is, uh, the harder it gets to detect, and that's also directly proportional to the size of the bird, right? Um, so in our, in our V6, like you saw in that, that big slide I showed it earlier, uh, we will, uh, this whole sensor, the suite of sensors are, are going to be all upgraded to Im improve the detection rate for, detection range for small birds uh, for day and night. So it'll be a, a, a sensor, essentially a fusion of sensors that can do night vision, thermal vision, and invisible imaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for your presentation and for your enthusiasm. Um, I'm just wondering what are like the typical rates of collision in a wind farm that doesn't have identified technology and how much of a difference does this type of technology make in the protection of these birds? Um, uh, sure, yeah. so, so the, uh, earlier on I mentioned some of the studies, uh, it went to a particular study that was published uh, three years ago, did a multi-year study of antiflight before and, af and after, and also used a nearby wind farm without antiflight as a control, um, and determined that antiflight uh, reduce fatalities at the wind farm, um, and this is compared to a human curtailment program. Before identify, they actually had folks, <coughs> the, the crew on, on, the, on the wind farm um, that were looking for eagles, and they would manually shut down turbines to try to protect for the collision. So, so compared to that program, identify reduced fatalities by over 85%. Um, in terms of numbers, I mean, I, I think you, if you, uh, it's public record uh, uh, for the most part. So this particular wind farm in Wyoming, uh, the, the worst year was 15 eagles. Uh, 15, uh, one five. One 15. Five, 15 in one year. It is 110 tur ten turbines, so it's a very large wind farm. Um, uh, but, but obviously those, are, those are numbers are significant enough for golden eagles, which, you know, their, their populations are, are it's, it's certainly very sensitive in the winter. Thank you. And Carlos, could you turn your mouth off? Thank you. When a wind turbine is curtailed, how long does it stay off? And then, as we know, many of these birds will circle an area. And how do you, how does the identify uh, deal with that? So um, it, it varies quite a bit. So um, depending on the model turbine, so some of the more more modern turbines are able to slow down, essentially <clears throat> shut down in about 15 seconds, while some of the older models can take two minutes. Uh, and, and so it varies very much with the model turbine at the particular wind farm, but say for the, for the fast responding turb uh, turbines, um, we will actually track the bird, and as soon as we determine that it's out of the danger zone, we'll restart the turbine. And if the bird circles back, we'll shut it down again and repeat. <laughs> and this happens often, actually, yeah. in Tasmania. The, these, these, the wedgies, they just love to fly, yeah. and they just do all kinds of maneuvers. Uh, so that will happen all day long. They, they'll curtail and, do, and come back and come back, and we'll, and we'll shut down the turbine every time. How much does each have, each pod cost? <laughs> um, well, let me put it in this term. So, so the, uh, the, the cost to a developer is less than 1% of uh, the investment, in, the cost of a turbine. Um, in, in, but I, but the, the biggest concern for a wind 
energy, you know, energy producing plant would be how much is it going to cost me year over year and in, in, in energy losses. And that is actually uh, uh, in, in this wind farm in Wyoming, it's actually less than 0.2%. Um, so it's, it's very, very manageable. Uh, there are other sites where you have a local population, resident population of eagles, uh, such as the one in Tasmania, it's more like 1% because they live there year round. And, and um, uh, but that's more of a you know a very highly active site with local population. So maybe that hope, that helps to give you an idea. Well, I was talking about how much is each pot, how much is each. How uh, does the system cost? Each system cost. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I leave that to my salespeople, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it varies quite a bit. So in, in the United States, um, eagles are protected. Bald eagles are, and, and golden eagles are both protected. Um, and if you kill an eagle, you can be prosecuted and you can suffer some very severe uh, fines if you're, you know, if you're found to not, uh, to, to, to be delinquent and in, Minimizing the risk of those evils. So ultimately, that's how it works in, in the United States: is that you, you can get some serious fines. So, so the the trend, uh, well, the pattern you see in is that developers are now become a, a lot. A, a, it, in the past several years, it's become much more enforced, and Fish and Wildlife has actually been very very active about it. And so that, um, and actually, I believe next week uh, that they're gonna. Uh, publish a, a brand new rule uh, from Fish and Wildlife that allows a, a, a better process for getting permits so that so that there should be the obstacles for obtaining a permit uh, for a wind farm. Um, the importance of the permit is that you know it, it, it gives you some protection in case an incidental uh, an accident happens, right? But you have to demonstrate in the application that you're doing something to prevent collisions. Right? You're incorporating technology, or you're mitigating, you're avoiding, uh, you're taking measures. So maybe that helps a little bit. And but other countries is different. You know, um, in Europe, what, you, what you've seen uh, in, over the last ten years is that wind development pretty much came to a standstill uh, because, it, for the most part, particularly in Germany, is. Um, you cannot develop the wind farm unless you have a permit. And that permit must include uh, in, in protection for environmental impacts. And there was no solution for, for uh, protection of, of bird species there until recently. That's cool. Okay, last, last question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to build on this work. I work for Holy Cross Energy, the one of the local electric utilities here, and uh, we, we had a pretty large wind farm come online uh, just in 2023. That's in Cape Carson County, and uh, there's there's a lot of variability between the kind of difficulty or ease of the permitting process depending on the local government, and in this case, it was private land, Cape Carson County, not the most stringent when it comes to environmental regulations. But especially if you're trying to develop like close to a federal nexus, BLM lands or something, that can trigger the NEPA process, which makes it very, very onerous to like kind of provide, you know, mitigation strategies, uh, uh, you know, about environmental stuff. But ironically, the NEPA process is often used to just really slow development of clean energy on the basis of you know people's concerns about aesthetics versus you know actual wildlife concerns. Happy that there's technology that's making it possible to make sure the path to clean energy doesn't, you know, has minimized conflict with wildlife. Very true. Yes, and that's if, you know, if we could get the wind farms to be rewarded or to make it incentivize them, 
they would do it because at the beginning, if they're building it, we don't cost anything. So, but after they're fined and then they have to go through the legal process and then put our systems in, it's a lot more, it's a lot more work. So yeah, they could go in in the beginning, which that's in Uzbekistan actually, that they are not allowed to run their turbines without us and in Tasmania, that that was part of the deal to build it is they had to put us in, get us running, and then they can run their turbines. So we like that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.